Back in July of 2013, I was doing a little solo backpacking around the Olympic Peninsula up in Washington State, with various stops in the Olympic National Park. A few days in, I happened to stop in Quinault and ended up on some random road that dead-ended on a beautiful spot at the edge of the Quinault River. It really was something to see. There was this old footbridge that led across the river and it looked like something out of the Lord of the Rings. With it being July, it was way too hot outside and there I am, all alone with all this crisp, clean, cool-looking water just sitting there in front of me. By that point, I don't think I'd actually washed properly for maybe four or five days, so I wasn't exactly feeling at my freshest. You can probably guess what came next. I drove my car all the way to the edge of the dead-end road, turned it around, just in case I needed to get out of there in a hurry, then started hiking down an embankment to the edge of the water with a towel in hand. I didn't have any swimwear with me at the time, but I made a note to pick some up in the future and figured a quick dip in my underwear could have me nice and clean without feeling too exposed. It sounds weird considering how deep in the woods I was, I mean, it seemed like I was totally alone. But heavy emphasis on seemed because, as it turned out, I wasn't totally alone. You know how people talk about that feeling of being watched? It seems like a total cliche, doesn't it? Like surely it depends on how paranoid the person is. Well, I'm not in the least bit paranoid, and I'd go so far as to say I'm something of an exhibitionist. I have friends that would rather pony up for a hotel just to use the bathroom, hence why I was backpacking alone. I didn't feel like I was being watched necessarily, so much as it dawned on me that what I was doing was just a bad idea. I couldn't work out why at first. It's not like great whites are known to swim up into the Quinault, but in the end, it just felt like I was too exposed, too vulnerable. I tried telling myself I was being irrational, but I just couldn't seem to shake the feeling. So, after just a few minutes of scrubbing, I climbed out of the river, then walked over to the spot I'd stashed my clothes and towel. As I'm walking up the embankment, keep in mind that I have my back to the other side of the river, and since I was at my clothes and towel, it kind of felt like I was at a home base. Yet just when that feeling of exposure and vulnerability was going away, I happened to catch a glimpse of something on the opposite bank. I honestly thought it was a bear or something at first glance, but it quickly became obvious that a bear was the least of my troubles at that moment. Standing on the opposite side of the river, a little higher up than me, was a man. It looked like every single item of clothing he was wearing had been hand-stitched and made from animal hide. His hair kind of looked like dreadlocks, but I later realized that some of his hair strands looked more like they'd been woven around twigs. He looked like a full-on mountain man. Like I remember my skin crawling when I saw my boyfriend playing that dumb cowboy game years later. He was obsessed with making animal clothes and one of his outfits looked almost exactly like my peeping Tom. Only, peeping Toms are just an annoyance, whereas I know this guy had other stuff in mind. After just staring at each other for a moment, totally surprised to have come across one another, the guy made a beeline for the rickety old bridge. At first, seeing that made me feel like I was going to puke. I was praying that the worst it'd get would be him shouting, put some clothes on or something. But the fact that he wanted to close the distance without even saying anything to me, he obviously didn't have good intentions. I just burst into action and grabbed my car keys, clothes, and shoes, but they got tangled up in some blackberry vines, so I made the split-second decision to just leave my clothes and get out of there with my life. When I made it out of the blackberry bush, I could see he was crossing the bridge toward me rapidly. I got to my car, flung my door open just as he'd arrived. I locked the doors while he pounded on the hood of my car, just screaming and grunting non-verbally. The moment he went for my driver's side door, I hit the gas and took off as fast as I could. I looked back and he was chasing after me. He must have run after my car for at least a mile until he faded from view. I was bleeding everywhere from running nearly without anything on through blackberry bushes and I was wet, unclothed, shaking, and crying. And I hesitated for just a few seconds longer, 
I don't think I would have made it out alive. Even typing the story out again all these years later, I'm starting to shake. I felt like I was being hunted. That is the only way I can describe it. I'll never, ever go back to that area. Since then, I always bring a hiking buddy with me when I venture out into the forest. That day is going to haunt me for my life. I've had many years of therapy and that experience is still as vivid as the day it happened. I'm a hydrologist, which basically just means I studied water for most of my 20s and somehow didn't go insane from the boredom. All jokes aside, it's actually much more interesting than you might think, and if you get a decent degree from a decent college, then your job prospects are actually pretty vast. We work with farmers to ensure your food grows. We work with treatment plants to make sure your water's clean. We also make sure this water then makes it all the way to the comfort of your home in plentiful supply and without being contaminated. We also do things like survey sections of a river that have the potential to be dammed up. With good surveillance, a dam can be a source of plentiful green energy without being too destructive to the surrounding flora and fauna. And it was a surveillance job that took me out to the wilds of Washington during the summer of 2017. And given the time of the year, it seemed like a pretty sweet gig. On the surface, it was a highly paying, high pressure job that could make or break someone's million dollar government contract. But between you and me, it was a paid hiking vacation. I'd navigate around, assess the bedrock, make a few notes. I figured the whole job would take no longer than about five or six nights. That way, I could take my time soaking up the pay as well as the sun. And I didn't last three. By the evening of the third day, I was hightailing it out of the woods as fast as I could, carrying only my car keys, my phone, and a survival knife. There's something going on up in the woods of Colville National Forest, and I think it might be very, very bad. The first day was when I arrived in a little place called Onion Creek, a quiet little town with a general store that I used to pick up a few last-minute supplies. When I asked the clerk for a good, quiet spot to park my car, the clerk was nice enough to offer me the free parking space around the back of the store, telling me he'd personally keep an eye on it while I was hiking up the pine-infested hills. The pines I was ready for, but the hills I was not. I like to think I'm quite an athletic guy, but my god did those hills take it out of me. Even walking in a snaking pattern to reduce the overall steepness Lugging my gear up the side of my first camp was nothing less than agony, and I slept like the dead that first night, having barely had the energy to get my work done. The next morning was more of the same, burning calves and a back soaked with sweat. But I was keeping positive, telling myself it made for one heck of a workout, even though I don't think I'd ever been that exhausted before. Worst part was just how bad I smelled and the idea that I'd descend to the river, get nice and clean, only to be incredibly sweaty again by the time I got back to camp. It was like a hygiene-based Kafka-esque nightmare. I made do with baby wipes on that second night, promising I'd get an actual wash on the third day, which would coincide with topping off my water supplies. So, the morning of the third and final day, I wake up with a raging headache. I take some painkillers, put on my boots, then walk off into the woods to, you know, do my business, only to find that my pee looks the color of Jack Daniels. I was seriously dehydrated, having rationed my water supply maybe a little too conservatively. I then take it upon myself to immediately hike down to the river, drink my body weight in fresh water, and actually get myself clean while I'm there. On arrival, I chug some water, then stripped down to my underwear before immersing myself in the shallows, knowing I'd be able to change my boxers back at camp. I give myself a rinse, but as I'm getting up and getting out, I'd swear I saw something on the bank near where I'd left my clothes. I mean, unless it was a very isolated gust of wind, then something was definitely moving among the trees. I'm a little spooked, but having some deer watching me wash isn't anything to really worry about. So I just grab my stuff, towel off a little, then 
start hiking back up to camp. Later that day, as I'm out hiking, I start getting this god-awful smell from somewhere. At first, I was thinking it was me, like maybe my clothes just stank, or I'd been stealth sprayed by a skunk or whatever. But the further I walked, the stronger the smell got, until I was literally struggling not to retch at how bad it was. Then, right as I'm about to puke, I look up in this bid to get to higher, fresher air or something, and there it is. It was either a fox or a coyote, but in such a bad way that I couldn't tell the difference. It honestly looked like someone had caught the thing, then just beaten it to death before hanging it up in a tree. The only reason I could think for anyone to do that would be to, like, scare the foxes off a person's farmland. Brutal, but effective, I guess. But no, I don't think there was a farm for miles around. Yet it wasn't long before I realized that the fox-slash-coyote thing wasn't the only corpse strung up in the trees. I kept walking, trying to get away from the smell. It was hot, so you can imagine how bad it was, but no matter which direction or how far or fast I walked, I couldn't seem to shake the smell of death. And like I said, that's because the dead were all around me. It got to the point where there was something strung up in every other tree in various states of decomposition. I spotted dead raccoons, rabbits, moles, and rotten weasels. Heck, I even think I spotted half a deer skeleton up there at one point. At least, I hope it was just a deer skeleton. After that, like I mentioned at the start, I basically just turned tail and ran. Didn't bother packing up my tent or anything like that. I just bailed back to where my car was parked in Onion Creek and just got out of there. I don't want to think about how much money I lost from walking away from that job. I'd type it out if I didn't think I'd puke all over my keyboard. But at the same time, I can't really think of a number that would make me go back out there and risk ending up like one of those poor animals, hanging in the trees. During my college years, I used to work at a summer camp for Boy Scouts. This all took place during the summer after graduation and was therefore the last time I worked at the summer camp. Every week I had to take a big group of campers out to a fairly secluded spot in the woods. Spoilers, it's not that secluded. Further wilderness survival badge. The activities involve things like building a shelter out of twigs and leaves, then sleeping in it overnight. How to make a campfire how to cook food on said campfire, stuff like that. Like I said, we were hardly in the middle of the Rockies, more like half a mile from camp, but we used to walk them in circles for a while, so the place we ended up felt extra secluded. Anyways, on this one night, all the campers had made their shelters. We cooked dinner, then were all just sitting around the campfire, singing songs and telling spooky stories. It was getting late, but... It's Boy Scouts, so think like 10 p.m. So I sent all the campers to their shelters for the night, then started breaking down the campfire in line with our usual health and safety routine. That's when we heard what sounded like a church bell chiming in the distance. The sound was pretty faint, but myself and the kids could most definitely hear it. The bell chimed for only a couple of minutes, maybe every 10 seconds or so, but since we'd been telling creepy stories around the fire... The kids started to get a little freaked out, thinking it was like ghosts or something. Obviously, I'm doing my job, telling the kids it's nothing, just a late night church service in the nearest town. But honestly, I think my duty of care was the only thing that stopped me from getting creeped out too. You see, to my knowledge, there wasn't a town or church within like 20 miles of us. This was later confirmed when I double checked a map of the area. And when I asked an older camp counselor if there happened to be any rural churches in the area, he said no, but then I followed up by asking if there was a reason why I might be hearing church bells out in the woods so late at night. He then proceeded to give me what I can only describe as a very uncomfortable look, but then tells me he'd heard it too and it was nothing I should worry about. I actually wasn't worried about anything until he said that. 
Yeah, I'd been a little creeped out at the time, but honestly more confused than anything. Like I said, I thought our camp was way out in the woods by at least 20 miles, so to learn I'd been wrong about that was confusing to say the least. I'd have probably been a little more curious if Bill, the head counselor, said he hadn't heard the bells too. That made it seem a little more normal. Right up until Bill cancelled the remaining wilderness camps the very next day. All the other junior counselors were bummed out, as the whole wilderness camp was definitely one of the most entertaining activities. But they just kind of shrugged it off and moved on. Whereas for me, that was when I actually started getting really spooked. Because if it was just nothing to worry about, as Bill had said, why had he decided to cancel the remaining trips? When I confronted him on it, I say confronted, I mean I asked politely, he told me there had been a handful of bear sightings in the past 24 hours, and that he didn't want to risk it. Totally watertight answer, I thought. We were up in northern Utah too, so we're talking a lot of grizzly and black bears, especially after a wet spring like we had that year. But to pretend like it was totally unconnected to the chiming bells, and to never tell me why they obviously made him nervous, that was something that left a really bad taste in my mouth. We didn't have a single incident of kids going missing or seeing strange people in the woods, not at any point for the whole time I was there. But to my knowledge, no one saw any bears either, nor did they find any signs of them in the area. And there were no signs of scratching on trees, no bear scat, nothing like that. So I have trouble reconciling that all Bill had been concerned about was bears. Yet unfortunately, that's where the answers ended. Since I was incredibly busy with all my duties, it's not like I had the time to run around playing amateur detective. And besides, I kind of liked Bill and had worked with the guy for literally years at this point, so I didn't exactly want to call him out on his lie and risk jeopardizing our relationship. On top of that, as much as I would have liked to have gone running around the woods like Mulder minus Scully, but then again... Being all alone in the Cache County woods in spring is definitely in the top 10 dumb things to do in Utah. So, that was that. I never worked the camp again, and no one was ever hurt. Not by mysterious bell monsters from the woods anyways. So no further light was shed on the whole weird bell chiming situation. But it definitely became my go-to creepy story in the time that's followed. One that remains all the more potent because... Whatever was causing that sound, and why the head counselor started acting so skittish in the days that followed, it all remains a complete mystery to me, even all these years later. I studied biology in college, and one semester we had a guest speaker come in to lecture us. We all recognized her name immediately, as she's quite a big name in the world of orangutan conservation research. After her talk, we discovered that she needed two students to go do research for a year after graduation, research that was taking place in Borneo. I've always wanted to travel, I just didn't know where I'd ever get the money. So, to have it all paid for by the research foundation was just a godsend. And as a girl who grew up in suburban Indiana it doesn't get any more exotic than Borneo, which is way out in Southeast Asia, just south of the Philippines. The whole trip was a dream come true, but I cannot stress this enough. It was hard work. We used to have to wake up at like 3.30 a.m., six days on, three days off, then spend like 14 to 15 hours in the hot and humid rainforest, tracking wild orangutans and recording and taking data every two minutes. These were wild orangutans. We tried our best to keep our distance and never tried to touch them. The goal was to observe them while trying not to affect their natural behavior. That being said, over my year there I did get charged by one of the big dominant males in the area on three separate occasions, which is its own terrifying story to tell another time. He never did touch me, but sure scared the heck out of me and made me run. It was exhausting, both physically and mentally, and the literal legions of mosquitoes made being out there almost unbearable. 
On top of that, we had absolutely no communication to the outside world, except on our days off when we had to walk almost an hour to a tree stand in the jungle. The signal strength wasn't nearly enough to make any actual calls, but we could sometimes get one bar of service and send a few WhatsApp messages to family and friends. You'd type them up, then once that bar came through, all the messages would slowly send. Then it was back on airplane mode to save battery and someone else took their turn. One morning when I was on shift, we all got up, did our morning routines, then walked off into the jungle at first light. I was incredibly tired, legitimately struggling to keep my eyes open, but in the space of just a millisecond, I went from half asleep to wide awake, because crouched among the foliage, just a few meters off the trail ahead of us, was a clouded leopard. It stayed still as a statue, just staring at us with these big amber eyes while, while myself and the other American researcher I was with just froze. I can't stress how rare encounters with leopards like that are, not only because they're so endangered, but because they tend to keep well away from any human encampments. I figured since it saw us it was about to run off in the opposite direction, and I remembered having this distinct feeling of, enjoy this while it lasts. But when the leopard raised itself up on its haunches, then took a few creeping steps towards us, the fear kicked in. Luckily, one of the indigenous people we worked with took out his slingshot and fired rocks at it, and all it took was one rock landing near the thing and it disappeared back into the jungle. It took us a good five minutes to actually calm down, and our guide explained to us that it was probably a much younger leopard that was curious about us. It might have been watching us during the night, then came back at first light, and we just sort of bumped into it on the trail startling it so badly that it just went into fight or flight. If it wasn't for our guide, we'd have been in serious trouble, and I think one of us probably owes him our lives. Anyway, once we felt like we were ready to continue, we carried on down the trail. Like I said earlier, it was still really early in the morning and the canopy is pretty impenetrable anyway, so as much as there was enough light to see, there is still a lot of dark patches among the foliage and stuff. As you can guess, I wasn't comfortable with that at all, so I got out my flashlight and started shining it into the thicker, darker patches of jungle. First one, I see nothing. Second one, I see nothing. But the third one, boom, pair of glowing eyes just shining back at me. My flashlight wasn't enough to completely light the leopard up, but there it was, unmistakably watching us from the darkness. And this is how I get around to telling you why we work such long hours and for just prolonged lengths of time. For a variety of different reasons, jungle research can be dangerous, really dangerous, and predatory big cats can be the least of your concerns sometimes. Needless to say, we couldn't exactly just push on with a leopard stalking us. I mean, they're ambush predators, so theoretically if we kept our eyes on it, we'd have no problems. But just try keeping your eye on something that's evolved for millions of years to not be seen. Besides, one little mistake, one little slip up, and one of us might have lost their life. And no zoological breakthrough is worth losing someone on a research trip. So, yeah, getting hunted by a clouded leopard, definitely the scariest thing that happened on my Borneo trip. My name is Tim, and I'm a member of the UK-based walking charity, the Ramblers Association. We're a group that's all about celebrating the pleasures of walking and hiking, as well as protecting the outdoor spaces that people love to visit. I know, I know, it sounds pretty boring, and I'll readily admit that most of the membership consists of anorak retirees and Bear Grylls wannabes, but Sunday morning strolls aren't the reason I got involved with the Ramblers, and when you look into their history, you realize they were actually pretty hardcore at one point. So, to keep it short and sweet, the whole rambling movement kicked off in the late 19th century. Basically, all of these fat cats wanted to just buy up vast swaths of the countryside and make it completely private. 
Naturally, this caused outrage, and there were protests in the form of mass trespassing on private land. There were scuffles and arrests, people got hurt, it was a huge deal, with the events snowballing into there being an official right-of-way law being passed through Parliament. In short, when you go off rambling, you're not just having a nice weekend walk somewhere, you're exercising hard-earned political rights, you're maintaining your fundamental freedom to access naturally beautiful places, and to me, that's a beautiful thing in and of itself. Excuse the plug, but that's generally what I tell people to spark a kind of rebellious interest in the Ramblers. We are a proselytizing organization, after all. But trust me, there are plenty of things I don't tell them about rambling. Things that, if I did tell them, might put them off exploring green spaces for good. Because if you go out on the regular, exploring forests and woodland and hill country of all types, you're bound to have a few encounters that you can't quite explain, and a few that downright scare you. And since I've already bored your socks off with the Rambler's history and ethos, I suppose it's fair that I share a creepy story with you. This is something I personally discovered while out rambling near Monmouth in Wales. So I'm walking through some rather deep woods around a place known as the Forest of Dean. I come across what I assume was this unremarkable little clearing. I had no intention of walking into it. It was drizzling and the trees were providing a nice bit of cover, and it only really caught my attention when I saw what looked like a ball of grass just floating in midair. It reminded me of one of those physical anomalies from the Tarkovsky film, and I just remembered stopping and staring at it for a moment as it gently swayed back and forth in the breeze. Obviously, on further inspection, I discovered that it wasn't really floating there. It was just hanging from a tree limb high above it. And still, someone had apparently made a ball of grass, and being the naturally curious soul that I am, I walked over to investigate. As I got closer, I realized it wasn't quite what I'd first expected it to be. At a distance, it just looked like a load of baled grass. But on closer inspection, I realized it was all solid turf. Like imagine if someone had just cut up a section of your garden and tied it into a ball. Only when I tried to find the seams of the thing, I couldn't see any. It was like a miniature planet or something, and for a good minute or so, I was absolutely transfixed by it. The twine used to tie it to the tree looked like it was homemade and entirely natural, and I imagine it must have taken someone of considerable skill to make it strong enough to hold the weight of the turf ball. Not only that, but it was tied to the tree branch of this old oak tree that had to be at least 20 feet up in the air. If nothing else, it made for an impressive piece of craftsmanship, and whoever had made and hung the thing was obviously very dedicated. I remember giving the turf ball a gentle push and then watching it sway back and forth for a moment as the patter of the raindrops was joined by the creaking of the big old branch above me. That's when I caught sight of what was below the hanging turf ball, and what I saw almost took my breath away. Directly below the turf ball was what looked like an old tree stump, only this particular tree stump looked like it had been filed or worn down by something until it was almost at ground level. The actual wood itself had been completely hollowed out so that only a thin ring of wood and bark surrounded an intricate display of twigs, reeds, and interwoven wildflowers. The pattern was like a series of expanding circles, kind of like a blooming rose, and there had to have been hundreds of small twigs in there, some bent into curves to achieve a bizarre, almost three-dimensional effect. I honestly think it must have taken days to put the whole thing together, I couldn't see any patches of grass missing from the clearing, so I'm guessing someone bought or grew the turf ball elsewhere and hauled it into the woods. They've probably brought a ladder too, or some complete mad lad, because climbing up a 25-foot oak tree is no mean feat either. I figured it might have been some kind of guerrilla art installation, or maybe the pet project of some eccentric green-fingered landowner, I don't know. But as I kneeled down to get a closer look at the tree stump rosebud thing, I noticed that not all of the little pieces were twigs. I picked out one piece, thinking it looked a lot like an old bone, only to find out that's exactly what it was. Given its small size, I initially figured it was just an animal bone, 
all before I heard a voice in my head telling me that it could just as easily come from a human finger or toe. Thoroughly creeped out, I'd dropped the bone the very same moment the thought occurred to me, but for some reason, I couldn't bear to leave it out of position and out of some strange sense of fear, I placed the small bone right back in the exact place I'd taken it from. My next thought is obviously something along the lines of, people need to see this. Only right as I stood up to reach for my phone, I swear I heard someone moving in the tree line behind me. I was a bit startled and as I turned, I remember hoping it was whoever had created the bizarre natural construct that I'd been transfixed by, but there was no one there. There's plenty of wildlife around Monmouthshire, and you get all kinds of deer, badgers, even weasels in some parts, so just because I heard a noise, it didn't mean it was a person. But I didn't hear any more scampering or rustling as whatever it was scurried away from me, and it was just silence. That's when I started to get the horrible feeling that someone was watching me. Out of pure nervousness, I called out a greeting, again hoping it was the turf ball's creator, and they were just, I don't know, nervous or something. Again, total silence, but it wasn't like I just imagined that noise behind me. There was most definitely someone or something there. I ended up putting my phone away, not daring to take any pictures. I had this deep, primal fear that if I had turned my back on whoever was out there, they might just use the opportunity to approach with less than pure intentions. I mean, if they'd already been willing to kill, or at least procure bones for their little art piece, God knows what they'd be willing to do to defend it. Maybe it was just my years playing tricks on me, combined with the mounting strangeness of what I was seeing just somehow getting the better of me. But I ended up backing away from that clearing, then basically power walking away with my head on a swivel until I was satisfied that I was at a safe distance. Safe from what, though? And as I started to consider that, the kind of haze of surrealness I'd been experiencing ebbed away, and I suddenly was left asking, what in God's name had I just seen? I wanted to go back. I really did. But the strong compulsion to stay away was the only thing that dwarfed the desire to go back and document the thing. I tried to tell myself it was nothing more than the work of bored hippies, and I had simply spooked myself by picking up an old animal bone. That was the most logical explanation, and therefore the most likely, so why couldn't I seem to calm myself down enough to walk back? I'm not a believer in the supernatural. I certainly like to think I could handle myself in a fight, and I know I'm biased, but the last word I'd use to describe myself is cowardly. But on my mother's eyes, in that moment, every fiber of my being was just screaming for me to get away and never visit that place again. I did end up going back, by the way. This is a true story, not some daft horror film with plot holes you can drive a truck through. Granted, it was weeks after the original encounter, it literally took me that long to pluck up the courage, so it gave whoever made the thing enough time to get rid of it. The amount of work that had gone into such a bizarre thing, on top of how visually interesting it was, it was almost a shame to see it gone. Someone had dug up all the inlay of the tree stump and had cut down the turf ball that had been hanging from the tree. I say almost because... Somehow, the fact that it was all gone now made the place all the more ominous. Like I get that someone else might have stumbled across the thing, maybe even bored kids who just decided to vandalize it. But then, what if it was just me discovering the place that prompted its destruction? And what if it had been destroyed to hide what was going on there? In which case, what exactly had they been doing? And what was so wrong that they felt they needed to hide it? I kicked over the remains over the tree trunk pattern, hoping to find one of the little bones I'd discovered previously, but there were none to be found. Then, just like last time, yet without the feeling of being watched, I backed away from the clearing and went about my ramble. The whole turf ball tree stump combo is without a doubt the single strangest and creepiest thing I'd ever seen while out rambling. 
Probably the creepiest thing I've seen in my entire life, actually. Sure, on the surface, it looked kind of cool. But the more I think about it, about the bones, about the strange person who wouldn't announce themselves, about what it could all mean, the more I'm just glad it's gone. On Sunday, May 19th of 1996, 26-year-old Lolly Winans and 24-year-old Julie Williams set off on a backpacking trip in the Shenandoah National Park, along with their beloved golden retriever, Taj. Julie hailed from St. Cloud, Minnesota, while Lolly grew up further afield in Unity, Maine, yet both shared a passion for nature and the outdoors in general. The couple had met nearly two years earlier at a now defunct nonprofit organization in Minnesota known as Woods Women, which taught wilderness survival skills and funded adventure travel for women. According to those that knew her, Lolly Winans was a micro brew drinking, fish following, cigarette smoking good time girl from a well to do family in Michigan. She left home after graduating high school and enrolled in Unity College near Waterville, Maine where she studied to become a wilderness guide. It seemed like Lolly loved the outdoors so much that she wanted to give others the experience of finding themselves in the wilderness just as she had. Julie Williams, on the other hand, was just a talented geologist. She was a successful high school athlete who won the Minnesota State Double Tennis Championship before traveling to Spain to study the extinction of the dinosaurs. After graduating summa cum laude, Julie found a job at a bookstore in Lake Champlain, Vermont, and the Shenandoah trip was intended as a celebration of her newfound employment. She was due to start work on June 1st of 1996, but Julie failed to show for her first shift, and people began to worry. On May 31st of 1996, having not heard from his daughter in just over a week, Thomas Williams reported Lolly missing. The subsequent search and rescue operation culminated in Julie and Lolly's car being discovered just north of Skyland Lodge. Bridget Bonnet, deputy chief ranger at Shenandoah National Park, later stated, We started doing hasty searches to cover all of those trail corridors in that general area to see if we could locate them. At some point during those hasty searches, we located the dog. Taj, the golden retriever, was wandering through the park unleashed. The following evening of June 1st, 1996, Shenandoah Park Rangers located and found the bodies of Julie and Lolly at their campsite near a horse track known as Bridal Trail. They had been bound and gagged before having their throats slashed. After recovering Julie and Lolly's camera, homicide detectives were given a glimpse of the last few days of the couple's lives. They had embarked into the woods of the White Oak Canyon Trail then hitched a ride with a park ranger after a turn in the weather. Once it cleared, they climbed Hawksbill, the highest mountain in Shenandoah, before setting up their camp in an idyllic spot next to an Appalachian stream. Detectives deduced that just a few short hours after the final photographs were taken, the couple's lives had been horrifically snatched away. Almost equally horrifying was the fact that their campsite was a mere quarter mile from the Skyline Drive, and a half mile from the Skyland Lodge, both popular gathering places complete with bars, restaurants, and guest cabins. Given that it was Memorial Day, the lodge must have been abuzz with hikers, tourists, and nature enthusiasts. Someone must have seen something. It was just a case of finding them. It seemed unfathomable that two dead bodies could remain undiscovered in such a well-frequented portion of the park, not to mention on a busy holiday weekend. Yet, backcountry regulations over the period stated that campers must remain away from designated trails, fire roads, and developed areas. Essentially, they needed to stay out of sight, which only played into the hands of their prospective killer. Yet, Julie and Lolly aren't the only couple to have disappeared in our nation's national parks. In fact, it seems frighteningly easy to get lost out there. This is for a number of different reasons. People have accidental falls take wrong turns, or have fatal encounters with wild animals, and statistically, the likelihood of actually losing your life in a national park is relatively low. 
but for some reason, murders and disappearances which occur in these places have a much sharper and much more distinct kind of horror to them, something that Sally Hurlbert and Shenandoah's management specialist was only too willing to admit. We don't have a lot of crime in the park, she said, but when we found those poor women, it was very intense. We were all very scared and worried about it. To think we'd shared the park with someone capable of that, it was very frightening. Special units of the FBI were assigned to the National Park Service in order to handle the investigation in conjunction with the FBI. The Virginia State Police's Special Crime Scene Unit were also enlisted to bring in specialist equipment. Yet, interagency rivalries prove the least of the team's concerns. Several factors make conducting investigations in National Park Service sites extremely challenging, one FBI agent explained. The first factor is that so many people are coming and going from the park each day. The year that Julie and Lolly were murdered, 1.57 million people visited the park. That kind of transient environment allows the perpetrator to easily slip through park gates unnoticed. Another agent added that any type of crime that occurs in an outdoor environment, your crime scene is probably 10 times larger than it would be in a residence. You have the initial crime scene where something happened and then you have the outer crime scene because you don't know which way the person came in or went. So the crime scene in and of itself tends to be larger and harder to contain and process. In the years that followed, the National Park Service and the FBI joined forces to conduct a nationwide search for their killer, including following up on an estimated 15,000 leads. But sadly, no serious leads were able to be generated and the case seemed destined to go cold. For more than a year, there were no new developments, until July of 1997, when the serenity of Shenandoah was shattered once again. Shenandoah's Skyline Drive remains popular with cyclists of all abilities, and in July 1997, Canadian Yvonne Malbasha was traversing the mountainous road. Yet as she pumped her pedals and admired the Blue Ridge Skyline, Yvonne was suddenly forced off the road by a man driving a large truck. Yvonne later said the man screamed vulgar profanities at her as he stepped out of the cab, before apparently attempting to force her inside. Thankfully, Yvonne was able to repel her attacker, taking cover behind a tree as the man retreated to his truck. But instead of fleeing the scene, the man tried to run her over. Yvonne endured a horrifying cat-and-mouse chase in which the man reportedly smashed his truck into a tree. Eventually, he gave up and sped away, but park rangers apprehended him as he attempted to escape the park. He turned out to be a man named Daryl David Rice. Following the search of Daryl's vehicle, investigators found zip ties in the glove compartment, presumably for use in restraining his victims. Little was known about him, but at the time of Yvonne's attack, he was in his late 20s and living in Columbia, Maryland. Although he had no previous criminal record, Rice was apparently fired from his job at Maryland's MCI System House in June of 1997, with his recording stating that he was extremely volatile in his interactions with co-workers and customers. Other employees stated that Darrow often threatened and yelled profanities at them, and once punched a hole in the wall of the men's bathroom after being caught stealing lunches from the break room. The following year, Darrow pled guilty to the attempted abduction and was sentenced to 135 months in a federal penitentiary. Interviews which followed his arrest led prosecutors to believe that Daryl may have, in some capacity, been involved with Julie and Lolly's murders. Reasons cited were the close proximity of the two incidents, the predatory behavior Daryl exhibited in his professional life, and the exclusive selection of female victims. Daryl was also videotaped entering the park at Front Royal on May 25th of 1996 and was sighted again at Rockfish Gap on May 26th, right in conjunction with Julie and Lolly's camping trip. Daryl then returned with his friends on June 1st, possibly in an attempt to dispose of the bodies, but the police presence seems to have deterred him. Daryl later denied that he ever visited the park in late May, but he did admit that he was there on June 1st in the company of friends. This was in direct contradiction to publicly available security footage. The cops had caught him in a lie. Even with this circumstantial evidence, 
It wouldn't be until five years after their deaths that the state attorney general would announce the indictment of Daryl David Rice in the murder of Julie Williams and Lolly Winans. In a 2001 press conference, prosecutors alleged that Rice stated on several occasions that he enjoys assaulting women because they are, in his words, more vulnerable. Yet perhaps even more chillingly, the prosecutor stated that Daryl had at one point admitted to the murder, arguing that the women deserved to die because they were a lesbian couple. Daryl was ultimately charged with four counts of capital murder, two of which were stated to be hate crimes. This meant that if convicted, Daryl would be eligible to receive the death penalty, yet he was never sentenced. Despite prosecutors spending years building the case against Rice, in the end, it was a lack of forensic evidence that found them wanting. But later in 2003, a single hair found at the crime scene was sent away for testing. Investigators counted the days until the results came back, but when they did, it was clear that Daryl David Rice couldn't possibly have been the killer. Following that little revelation, the whole case fell apart. And even though the FBI will not discuss persons of interest, the murder of Julie and Lolly remains an active investigation. Last year, around the 20th anniversary of Julie and Lolly's murders, the FBI circulated a press release and updated posters. The case remains an open and active investigation, said Agent D. Rabisky. It's our hope that any continued coverage of the girls' murders will one day generate that one crucial piece of information that may bring someone to justice and peace for their families. If they were still with us, Lolly and Julie would be pushing 50 by now, still happily living together, still indulging in their mutual love the outdoors. Yet while time marches on, the women are still remembered by their loved ones, the FBI and the old timers at Shenandoah who were working in the park all those years ago. When I found out that they were geologists, that hit me because I'm something of an amateur geologist myself remembers one former park ranger. I felt bad knowing that they were out having a good time, looking at the rocks, enjoying themselves, and then something horrible like that happened. I was a very young ranger at the time, and it affected my career. Before that, I may not have taken the law enforcement part of my job as seriously as I do now. I was a backcountry seasonal, you know? I was having a blast. I didn't think about people getting murdered in the park. It changed the way I thought about things after that. It changed the way I trained for things. I changed a lot of stuff about how I did my job. It had a profound effect on me and I know it did on the people who worked that case. Over two decades have passed since Julie and Lolly were killed in Shenandoah National Park. The shock of their murders is now just a shadow on an otherwise peaceful recreational paradise. But the next time you're up old rag or you're stargazing in the big meadows, take a moment to think of Julie and Lolly, two young lovers whose lives were cut short by a person of unimaginable evil. I've lived in the Smokies most of my life, always fairly secluded places, always nice and quiet and always surrounded by the woods. One night, a few years back, I was sitting on my porch at around one in the morning, just drinking a beer and just appreciating the stillness and the quietness. If you haven't lived out here, during the summertime, nature isn't quiet at nighttime. In fact, it can be very, very loud. The cicadas are humming, frogs are belching, occasionally you hear the grunts and squeals of other animals too. It's like the ultimate white noise. It can be real relaxing sometimes, but... Other times, nature throws things at you that are downright terrifying. So this one time I'm sitting out on the porch, drinking my beer, and all the while that old white noise of nature is just droning on and on. But then, all of a sudden, everything went quiet. It washed over the woods like a wave or something, until you could have heard a pin drop at a hundred yards. Then out of nowhere... I heard the most terrifying noise I'd ever heard coming from about 30 to 40 feet in front of me. It was this incredibly loud, blood-curdling shriek, unlike anything I'd ever heard before. I knew it wasn't a mountain lion, 
I've heard those before and they tend to all stay well away from many people. It just had this real human quality to it. But at the same time, I knew it wasn't a person. People don't make noises like that. Not when they're sane, anyway. I just got up, walked back inside, and sat by the front window with my 12-gauge within arm's reach until I was too drunk to be scared anymore. It was the one and only time I've ever heard that noise, and I pray to God I'd never hear it again. Some people have suggested it was a bar now, as they can make some pretty creepy screeching sounds late at night. But honestly, there's no way it was an owl. Those things are tiny, and whatever I heard sounded way bigger than just a bird. It didn't make repeated cries either. It made one long shriek before I heard it moving away from me through the woods. And unless we get a rare breed of barn owl out here that runs on fours or two legs, I can safely say it wasn't a bird. I don't live around those ways anymore, and I'm glad of it, too, because whatever was within about 30 feet of me that night, I'd prefer to be far, far away from it. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, take a moment, look at your hands and ask, who's in charge?